Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, brilliant. Um, more importantly, I'd like to introduce you to Anand. He's going to be talking about one step at a time. Um, I was asked him sort of what he'd like me to introduce him and if there was any important fact. Um, and he seems to be after Twitter followers. So um, <laughs> I suggest all of you follow at Testing Geek because he's got an awful lot of important things to say. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now. Good luck. Good. Thank you. Good. Good morning, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to present this little talk. And uh, I would also like to thank Jason and Simon and entire dev community for creating such a wonderful tool. I've been in testing for over a decade now, and I have used tools such as Silk Test and Rational Robot and QTP. And I would never want to go back again in that world. So thank you for creating such a wonderful tool. I would start by acknowledging my current employer, Camelot, where we have pretty much learned and developed all the ideas that I'm going to present here. And by the way, our head of development, Bernie Miles, is here. So if you guys are looking for interesting opportunity, he might be the person to get in touch with. And I would like to thank. Uh, Ellen Richardson, whom you may know as Avil Tester, or the author of Selenium Simplified Book, for shaping and sharpening and developing most of these ideas at work with us. And lastly, my wife, Komal Joshi. And this, both of us are self-proclaimed testing geek. And our discussion around testing and test automation does not stop at work, or at blogs, or at feeds. We carry that discussion home as well. And as a result of that, we have become good at what we do, and we find it very nested effects in each other, but none of us is developer, so that's just lying in the backlog at the moment. We're training our son, so hopefully he will become a developer and will fix those defects. But for now, he will have to live with those defects. So talking about test automation, in, in my experience, test automation frameworks are never developed or designed or created upfront. They always evolved. They always evolved because of the changes around the project. They always evolve because of the needs of the project. When we start with any automation project, we usually start with a simple script, which proves a single point that, OK, this particular tool is probably right for the application that you are trying to automate. And that's the starting point. So when you start, we, we usually don't have any kind of abstraction layer. We usually don't have any kind of complicated stuff around our automation framework. It just proves the point that this tool is probably the right one for this particular application. And it's normally a vanilla script. Simple proves the point. That's it. So and as, as the need of the project changes, as you make progress in the project, when you identify that there is a need to have more complicated framework, you continuously refactor your existing script and reach to a point where it meets the need of the project in the context. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is that I'll take a very simple application not even application, a simple problem. And we'll start from ground zero by creating a Selenium IDA script. And then we'll continuously refactor it. And we'll try to give you um, inside information on uh, what goes in the mind when we evolve, evolve any kind of automation framework and how it is evolved over a period of time to solve a specific problem that we have at the hand. And at every stage, I'll try to explain why it is better than the previous refactoring that we did, and what benefits we have achieved by doing that refactoring, and what are the limitations of the current approach, and where we can go next. So with this, let's start with a very simple application form. So this is the normal registration form, which I've taken from my pet project, icheckwebsite.com. And it's a very simple registration form. You have four fields, sign up button, and it behaves as you would expect it to behave. So fill this form. Click on the registration button, you're registered, and uh, you'll be on the welcome page for this particular site. Pretty simple. So let's start with this. So if you've not done any kind of automation, and if automation excites you, then Selenium ID is probably the right tool to start with if you are working in the web application domain. It's a very simple tool. You install it as an add-on. You record all the actions that you need to in order to perform a specific test. And you can easily execute it. You have help at hand in the, in the form of uh, this little reference window. 
And the good thing is that you can export this script as a WebDriver script. Uh, so it's an excellent first step. But there are many problems with this approach. There are many problems with the Selenium ID. So it offers you only sequential execution. It does not have easy way to access data. There are no basic programming constructs available, such as like looping, such as decision making and stuff. And you cannot go beyond pages. So if you need to perform any checks at the database level or at the network level or anything which goes behind the pages, then it might become tricky. I know there are many add-ons which you can use along with Selenium ID to get around these limitations. But you can do much better than, much more better than that by just moving to WebDriver. So let's have a look at how a script would look like if you just export that script. So we have taken the first step. We created the script in Selenium ID. And now we have exported that script into the WebDriver world. So one thing that you would notice, that, notice is that when you export these scripts into the WebDriver, they are not, they are not as good as it should be in the form of automation framework. But it, these scripts does provide you a lot of functionality out of the box. For example, they come up with, uh, they are always exported as some form of unit testing framework. So if you, if you export this in uh, Java, then the script would be created in JUnit style of thing. So you get the power of uh, setup and teardown. So you can have your test environment set up. You can have your uh, teardown to clean up your systems and stuff. But if you don't make any changes around the script, then, then they are probably, they will suffer from the same limitations. So for example, if we don't build anything around this, then second time you run this test case without cleaning the system, this test will fail because this user is now already registered in the system. So it's important to move, continuously move and uh, make changes so that your automation becomes more robust. So it's a step in the right direction, but there are many things to do. So we modified this script a little bit. And what we did is we created one little function, like get unique email address, with, uh, which does not exist in the database, to make sure that whatever user you are using for the automation is unique. So now your script is a little bit robust than what it was initially. You can execute it many, many times, and it will probably still work, because you're getting a new email address every time. It will not fail at that point. And we have also hidden some complexities and some redundancies around the code. So we had lots of clear kind of statements around the text boxes. We have statements like element by, and in the context of the test, that information is not useful you'll probably want to abstract and hide that information from the test. So we have taken the first step and hidden some of that information. So the test looks a bit more readable. It's a bit more robust. But let's see if it still has same problems that we had in the Selenium ID. So the only problem that we have removed is just making it by, we have just made it more robust by getting a unique email address. But apart from that, it suffers pretty much from the same problems that we had in Selenium ID. So let's see some of the problems that this script is suffering from. So for example, what, you, what if you change the element locators? If you change the element locators, you will probably need to change your test in response to that change. So you made some changes in the system, and now you have to make those changes in your test to accommodate what if you change the registration field? So right now, we have four fields in the form. But what if we start capturing more data, for example, phone number or address in the registration fields? You will, your test will need to change in, in, uh, in order to accommodate these changes in the application. What if you change rules around the data that you are using in the form? For example, what if you have a new rule which says password should have a special character? or email should not have uh, numbers in it because of whatever reasons. So your test will need to respond to accommodate these changes. What if you change the registration process? So instead of one page registration process, now you have three page or four page registration process. Your test will need to change in order to accommodate these changes in the application. And why would you need to make these changes? Is because your test is tightly coupled with the system information. Your test has information overload in the sense that 
test is a concept, it's proving that application work. It should not have knowledge about how the application is implemented. And this, the previous script that we saw, which was bad because it has information about everything. It has information about what elements you are using on the page. It has information about what do you mean when you register on a site in the, in the sense that you fill these forms and you click on the submit button. It had all this information. So the idea is to move away from that information. The idea is to move that information away from the test so that your test can become more independent, so that your test does not have dependency on the system or have as little dependency as needed. And when you have all this information embedded in the test, your tests are not readable. And if you look back at those tests after like a couple of months, you'll probably not make any sense out of those test cases. And that's why those tests become extremely difficult to maintain. So essentially, it's very difficult to have progress with that kind of script. So if we do not refactor and if we do not evolve into a decent automation framework, then essentially, we, we get into the risk of not maintaining and essentially shelving that automation project completely, eventually, if it, is it, if it becomes very difficult to maintain. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is pretty simple. Solution is just to decouple it. Solution is just to identify what are the isolated entities which we can remove from the test and use it within the test. So that's the simple solution. Because when you have less friction around the different parts of the automation project, then it becomes much more easier to manage. Then you know that, okay, this is the specific piece which is changing, so your changes are contained within that. And because of that level of abstraction, you have much more readability at the test level because you do not need to make changes into the test every time anything changes in the application. So wherever you are changing at the application level, if you can pretty much replicate that in your testing and change just at that level, your test automation efforts will become much more manageable and readable. All we need to do is find out what are the different elements of the system and then create appropriate layer to just, talk, just handle abstraction at that particular layer or encapsulate all the comp complexities around that layer. So now we'll talk about how we can evolve that scripts even more and create these abstraction layers. So the first thing is pages instead of elements. So if you're auto in, within your test, if you're accessing your elements directly, so that's the first sign that your test is overloaded with the information. And Using element is bad because of one more reason, because elements in isolation does not give you any context in the sense that how this element is used within the overall scope of solving a problem. But when you use page object instead of element, then it gives you much more context. So this is how your script might look like if we refactor the, the previous script and use page objects instead. So now we are saying that, okay, instead of saying set value for first name field, we are saying registration page set first name. Even if you read this script after a couple of months, you will still make some sense out of it that, okay, this is what I'm achieving. Probably there is a registration page somewhere in the application and I'm setting a specific field on that page. So it's much more readable. It's, it gives you much more context within the scope of this test. And as a result, it's probably more, uh, more maintainable than what it was before. So that's a good first step. Let's have a quick look at how WebDriver helps us in uh, achieving this page object model very easily. So WebDriver has the concept of page factory. So you can, you can have a class to represent your page in any, sense, any kind of logical sense. So for example, if you have a screen, so all the elements of that particular screen can go in that particular class and in the constructor you can initialize all these elements and then that class can expose all the functions which are related to the elements present on that particular page. And that makes it very simple to use because now you have one place to find elements on a specific screen. So it's like single point of entry anytime you want to access physical implementation for your application. So there is only one place to manage. If there is, if there is anything changes on, at the physical implementation layer, you know where to go and change. You don't have to make any changes at the test level. So that, that way you have kind of created first level of abstraction. And that, by the way, is the minimum that you should do. If you are not evolving your automation framework beyond this, then page object is at least something that you should do. And then page initializes everything. So you create this page object, and then you know that you can access those elements directly. And functionality is 
uh, exposed by these pages. So now you can kind of, uh, you got the idea that how we are progressing. So you can think, okay, what if we make this page object a little bit more intelligent? So what I mean by that is doing something like this. So in the previous script, if you recall, we had set first name, set last name, set email, and then click on button. But essentially what we are doing is registering a user, isn't it? So what if we make our registration page, which was kind of representing physical implementation a bit more intelligent and tell that page, okay, you know what, when you register this user, do all this operation, I'm giving you this data to act on, and then give me a welcome page. Now, you might think that this is a good approach, but what we are doing is that we are now polluting the page object. So initially we, we talked about having information overload at the test level, we are just overloading page now instead. So like what we are saying that, okay, uh, your test should not be overloaded with the information of how it's implemented at the, pay, at the physical layer. On the same lines, your actual implementation or the actual physical page, that should not have information about how business is working. So just to give you an example, what if I change this registration process and instead of giving a welcome page, we now have some kind of confirmation page. Now this registration page would need to change in order to accommodate that kind of changes, which is not the right thing to have because we are changing the business process and not essentially changing the implementation at the physical level. So that should not be changed. So what's the solution? Your test cannot be overloaded with the information about the physical pages. Your physical page should not have information about the test or the process. So basically what we need is a different layer which defines what needs to be done between these two layers. So test is the concept, it's proving something works, and your physical implementation provides an interface which is used to make sure that something works. And work is something which happens in between. So work is what test does using this physical interface. So on the same lines, we need to define one more layer, and we call it as workflow layer. So now, instead of accessing registration page directly from the test, we have this registration workflow. And using this registration workflow, we are registering a user. And because registering a user is a work, and registration workflow is something which represents different type of work that can happen at the application level, this workflow can have knowledge about the business. That when I register a user, I know I have to, ex I have to give a welcome page back. And at this level, we are pretty much uh, not relying on anything at all at the physical implementation layer. So this registrar user can pretty much hide all the complexities behind how a user is registered. So for example, if you are changing your locator, if you are changing anything on the elements, this test will still remain the same and you know where you need to make change at the registration page level. Or if you change your registration process from single page to like multiple page, this test will still remain the same because all you need to do is change this register user method. Which, is, which was handling one page before, and now you can handle three page registration process before. So we have moved away from um, physical implementation. So this test is a bit more robust than what we had initially. But there is still one problem. And that problem is around the data. Data is still pretty much tightly integrated in the test. So when you register a user, you are passing four fields. But what if you start to capture seven or eight different fields for a user? your test will still need to make changes. So now let's see how we can start using abstraction at the data level. And the easiest thing to do that would be to think in terms of domain. Whenever you are data driving any application and whenever we use any kind of data in our test automation scripts or projects, if we can start thinking about in terms of domain, then it will become much more easier for us to move that data out of the test and model it somewhere differently, model it somewhere else, so the test can just consume that data rather than relying on that data. So if you, if you think about the use in the form of user stories, so for example, as a user, I should be registered. And if you can identify noun within those user stories, then that might be a good indication that this should be modeled as a separate domain object rather than passing whatever attribute that user might have directly in the test. So when you do that, when you convert the data that which is being used in the application to the domain object, 
this is what you get. So now we have a user object which we are passing in the registration workflow and then we are doing some assertions on that. So that's much more cleaner than what we initially had at the Selenium IDA script. So this is very robust in the sense that now if we make, if we change the way data is captured about a user when registration process happens, that's encapsulated in the user object. So if I start adding four or five or seven or 10 different fields during the registration process, there's only one place to change. My test will remain same. And we have already discussed about the physical implementation layer. So this is, this is pretty robust. But if you think about it, how we are doing and what we are doing, this is probably not very clean. The, what we are doing is that we're creating a user object, then we are creating a workflow object, and then we are passing this user to this workflow. But what we want to achieve is that user should be able to register the site. So from domain, if we start thinking about adding behavior to the domain object that we have created, then it will give us a bit more clarity at the test level. So right now what we are doing is that we are just, in the previous script, we were just giving attribute to the domain. So for example, you, if you were talking about user, user can have first name, last name, email address, a password, that's all. But in reality, user can register on the site. So user has some behavior. So if we can add that behavior to this domain, then they can become actor. And as a result, our test can look that clean. So user, create a new user, user registers on site, and then fail if user is not registered on site, and fail if welcome page is not displayed properly. Now this is as clear as you can get if you have appropriate level of abstraction at appropriate level. And uh, there is hardly any maintenance cost in maintaining that kind of test of world. Even if you come back to this script after a year or so, you will still get complete information on what you are trying to achieve with this script. And this is, this is also more relevant in, the, in pretty much all the Agile projects because we, if we are talking about user story, it always starts with some kind of actor. So as a user, I want to do that. As a system, it should do that. So you already have that information about actor. You already have information about what you are trying to achieve within the scope of that story, what behavior should be there in, this, um, in that particular actor. Should be easy to model. So essentially, what we have done is that we usually have a problem which is solved by performing a work using some interface. And app solves that problem and test proves that problem is solved. App allows actor to work in order to solve a, pro solve a problem and test proves that actor can perform work. So at the test level, if we can, if we can uh, contain changes within these layers, then that's ideal. So if someone, something is changing at the physical implementation layer, so that change should be contained here. They should not affect anything at the work level or at the actual test level. If you change the way a specific process work, then that's the work which is changing. And as a result, you probably need to mimic those changes at the physical layer, but not upward. So any changes, if you can contain within that layer and downward, then that's ideal. That will make it much more easier to maintain and how have we reached here is by questioning continuously and brainstorming. We are fortunate that we have a really good team and we take brainstorming very seriously. So if you, to, if you continue to ask questions where you are at the moment, how your test would respond to changes in this layer, how you can improve, what are the different things that can be done, then eventually, eventually it will evolve. What you shouldn't be doing is that have a big meeting to decide what should be the design of the automation framework and then build it from there. So start with like simple scripts, single script, and then continuously evolve it. That's what we have done and it has worked for us so far. And another thing which is very important is not directly related to automation framework, which, but is extremely important is the execution infrastructure around your test automation project. So if your test automation projects are not executable, on the machines, whoever want to execute them, then it's not valuable. If they're not getting executed from the Jenkins or from any other CI system, then probably they're not as valuable as they can be. So that's, that's, the another, that's another thing where you should be investing time and effort. 
And once you have these things in place, then you can think about different value and answer. So for example, you can think about creating a mo one more layer on top of the test that you have in the form of maybe cucumber or maybe in the form of fitness to show business people how, what we are writing if they are interested in having, if they are interested in having uh, that kind of reports. Or you can also think about different kind of randomization that you use with the data. One of the argument we hear many times in the context of automation is that your uh, data is same every time you execute and your sequence is same every time you execute. Well, in my opinion, I think if you are doing manual testing, then maybe subconsciously you may use same data many times. So, for example, if you are testing something which goes beyond registration, you will probably use same set of data or same kind of data for the registration process. But in automation, you can enforce that randomization. When you're creating that user, you can have a set of valid value range or valid character range for a given field and then you can randomly generate those username every time you create a new user. So for example, in our case, um, for emails, we know what is the RFC for the email. So we have taken all the characters which are valid from the RFC point of view and have used it to ran randomly generate different email addresses every time a user is registered. And that's very useful. We found that, okay, regex at the dev level was not as good as it should be. And in terms of sequences, when you, for example, when you save a form, there are like four or five different ways to save form. You can click on the OK button, for example, or submit button, whatever it is there. You can navigate through tab and click on the enter, or you can be on any form field and then click on the submit button. There are different ways to, solve, uh, to save a form. You can hide that kind of complexity from the test, but within the routine where you are saving the form, you can have a very simple randomized routine which will pick up any of these methods to save form in any execution cycle. Or when you are filling the form data, you don't have to go from top to bottom every time. So at the test level, you're just saying register user. But what happens behind the scene, you are in control. So you can have a routine which will randomize form filling sequence. So instead of filling first name first, it will probably start from bottom. So you can do all those fun things, but everything can go behind the, behind the main test and they can sit in their appropriate layer. So essentially, that's a big warning sign. So if you have test or if you have any layer at any level which knows everything about the system or which knows more than it should know about the system, then that's a big warning sign. Then it shows that probably there is a need of refactoring somewhere in the system or somewhere in the layers because you don't want dependencies around different layers. You don't want information overload on those layers. So if you see I know everything kind of sign, then that's a big warning sign. And where we should get to is here. So if your test can say that, okay, I don't give a shit how you are implementing, then that's where you should be. And that that point, if you have any questions, happy to answer. Or you can grab me anytime. I'm here for the next two days. If anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and we'll point to you and uh, use the microphone on your seats. Yeah. For uh, creating that, oh wow, cool. Uh, the page objects, how involved is the development team in being able to standardize the, you know, the field names and things like that as, so they don't change them and thereby changing your page objects? Yeah, so we have been fortunate in the sense that uh, we work very closely with the dev guys. So most of the time they would put whatever ideas we need. And, uh, but yes, they use framework so sometimes it becomes painful for specific elements because Whenever you use framework, they will have their own way of generating IDs and generating grids and even a list, normal drop down would be nested in like two or three level of list and stuff. So we have those issues and we try to work around. But normally, in general, they are good enough to provide IDs whenever we need them. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you are not co-located and uh, 
if devs are not reasonable, then it might be a bit challenging, but we have been fortunate. So is there a danger using domain objects in your tests? Because simply you'll end up with a user object that it essentially needs to know about every page that it has to uh, interact with. I'm sorry, I did not get your question. Sorry, let me repeat that. So you suggested using domain objects in your tests like the user. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger using something like that? Because essentially you end up with a single object that basically you know, violates your principle of not uh, just knowing enough to be able to do okay. its work. Okay, so if you have a, a big system and there is only one type of user, then what you are saying is fine. But in our case, we have different type of users. That's one thing. And you have different type of data as well. So for example, uh, if you are working on the e-commerce site, your shop can be modeled in an object. Your credit card information that you're using, that can be modeled in an object. So it's just about finding out how you are using data within, you, within the context of your test and how easily, how easy it would be if you convert that data, if you move that data outside the test and convert them into some kind of object. So you have the risk, you have the risk of a couple of objects which are pretty bloated, but that's the normal behavior in the sense that if, for example, if you talk about Gmail, if you are modeling it in Gmail, for Gmail, your user should be able to use inbox, your user should be able to register, your user should be able to create draft, you should be able to do these things. But that's how, that's what a user is doing. So you will have to add this behavior if you are modeling it that way. And I don't see any risk. It's a bit bloated object, but it's the behavior. Oh, sorry, I could not hear that microphone. I uh, haven't discovered yet. When I discovered, I might be able to answer that. Where would you, where would you like to use uh, assertions or would you like to do that in each page or would you like to do it in your test level? Uh, what do you recommend? So, essentially not at the page level because what you are asserting is in the context of the test that you are writing, not at the page level. So for us, the way we treat our page is that page is a really dumb representation of the physical layer. So all our page object do is initialize all the elements and whatever method is needed to access those elements, like the setter, like the clicks, and that's it. Any information, like the assertion, we think that that information is in the context of the test. And for example, if you have thousands of test cases, how many test cases would need assertion at the page level? Not all of them. So whatever test needs that information, that should be at that layer. And we try to come up with a different abstraction layer to define all those assertions. So we have uh, DB checkers, we have page checkers. So you pass which page you want and then define what assertion you need to. But not, not at the page level. Anything else? Good. Guess I'm done then. Thank you. Thank you.